Hello, friends. Patrick McFarlane here of the Liberty Weekly Podcast, coming at you with another episode. This one is episode 187, and the show notes may be found at libertyweekly.net forward slash 187. And on the line with me, I am glad to be joined by Sean Leal. He is the author of Consent is Morality, and he is also a writer at Liber- libertyweekly.net. I almost forgot my own website. Sean, glad to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, man. And so I thought that we'd just kind of start out this interview just by talking about why you wrote the book, um, how you came to libertarianism, you know, just kind of that background info. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I've I've been in the background of, you know, liberty stuff for quite some time. As a matter of fact, I remember my first libertarian thought. I remember driving. I was like 16, 17 years old, and it occurred to me, I thought, where does the government get the right to tell me what plants I can grow? you know, about, you know, just that they can just illegalize marijuana. I mean, that seemed ridiculous. Um, and then I started seeing various, uh, just references to it, but very rarely at, at that time. Um, uh, but then I started, what, what was interesting is um, during the Bush junior years, um, I really, and I have to, unfortunately, have to admit that I fell for the whole weapons of mass t- destruction uh, line and and when i finally found out that we were being lied to that was like the kick in the pants like really got me researching things a friend of mine told me to read the shock doctrine uh, by naomi klein and so in trying to find a uh, a review for it i ran into the cato institute and so that's kind of when i really started digging more started reading um uh, Radley Balco, when he had a uh, he had a blog called uh, the Agitator, and that changed my entire worldview, as far as the police and you know the just the whole uh, the military industrial complex and everything. Um, so it just kind of went on from there. Um, you know, found reason. Um, interestingly, I did not really go through the kind of the, the common uh, Ron Paul. Uh, process. I didn't even know really who he was until much later. Um, so uh, when I, then, you know, just getting into Facebook groups and really just learning more and more about it, ultimately for the book, I, I really just kind of got tired of having the same argument of is morality objective? That discussion, it just it was driving me nuts. So I stopped and I really took a look at what it is that drove me to my conclusions. Could I prove, could I demonstrate uh, logically um, that in fact morality is objective? What is, if, it, if it is, what is it based on? And then just started talking to some friends and family members how I could expand the book from the one little piece, which is comparing the comparing consensual activity with morality um, into just a kind of a larger concept of uh, with a little bit more of a reach out to to those who may have never have heard uh, of these of these concepts. And so one thing I wanted to ask was, are you more of the right or are you more of the left? I know that's kind of like a some, some, some like um, ANCAP's bristle or voluntary's bristle at that question, but I don't know. That's not at all. I, I was a rah rah Reagan Republican growing up. Uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, saw him speak live uh, here in the San Fernando Valley um, back in the '80s, and so that's and that's why I was, you know, kind of behind the whole George Bush thing uh, because that's and what's interesting is that yeah, my parents were never a political ever. Didn't that. There were no political discussions in the house, not intentionally. They just, they just didn't care, um, and so uh, that's just kind of where I where I fell in. Um, but uh, I uh, certainly there was a, a kind of a left, um, socially left strain through through my house, through like on my mom's side, my mom. I guess you could probably classify her as a hippie um, uh, back in the day. And then my dad got a d- degree in computer science. So it was a really interesting household to kind of grow up in, uh, to getting both of these, uh, both of these uh, exposures. 
Yeah, that that's a. I mean, so your mom being a hippie, I guess your parents were both apolitical in a sense. But when you think hippie, you think more left, I suppose. Yeah, no, she was definitely definitely um, left when it when it came to social stuff. I mean, like you know, we had gay friends back in you know in the seventies and stuff, and we, we, there was the the call for you know for them to be able to be married and um, you know you know my mom with a very she had really bad arthritis so she was using medical marijuana way before it was ever considered legal um i remember i remember a conversation about prop 13 which is uh, a, a tax uh bill here in california which locked down the taxes and she was uh, property taxes and she was all for that which was interesting uh, because I guess there was probably liberal or left arguments for both sides of that. Um, so it's, it's, it was just a really interesting mixed bag, I have to say. Yeah. And it's, it's funny how things, you know, in, in life are, are kind of like that too. It's my parents were, you know, they grew up in maybe my dad grew up in more of like, uh, he wasn't very well off and, um, he ended up, you know, making his own business and kind of getting out of the cycle of poverty in a way. And so he was very conservative because he saw what his hard work did for, you know, him and us. And my, my mom's dad was a John Bircher. Mm. And so he was a school teacher at the same time, but he was a John Bircher. And so he, you know, knew some of the things that we're talking about, but he died when I was really young, but you know, me coming out, you know, growing up in kind of a conservative household, but, now my parents have gotten totally red pilled because of the whole COVID issue. So um, I don't even know what they would call themselves now. It's crazy. Interesting, interesting. Because both my father and his father, Louis Leal, um, came from academia. Uh, my father had a PhD in computer science. My grandfather had a PhD and actually uh, started a lot of the um, Chicano studies uh, movement. As a matter of fact, at UCSB, there's a um, endowed chair in his name. Uh, for his contributions to the Chicano literature um, study field, basically didn't exist before he was doing stuff. So even though there's that academia in my family, that, that I never, there was never kind of that, what you would normally expect or what a lot of folks in our circles would expect from uh, people in academia. Uh, they were just very cool, you know, just live your life kind of people. Yeah, yeah. And in a way, is that kind of like what the old left is, you know, in a sense? Yeah. So I just realized I pronounced your name wrong. <laughs> it's just, okay. It's like cringe. I'm just a gringo over here, but. It's really, really easy to do. As a matter of fact, my kids kind of pushed back on. It's like, can't we just call it Leal? Can't we just say that? It's like, oh, yeah. Um, Leal. I prefer Leal. Can you? <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. <laughs> I, I totally get it. No, I, I'm actually I'm a, I'm really bad at that. If people go back in the archives, I mispronounce names all over the place, which is dumb. But I, I'm the I'm I'm really bad at it too. I, yeah. Well, okay. Um, I was gonna ask. So you came in through the Cato route, and yeah. I I had some experience with Cato in the beginning. It's like when when you at least when I had was a greenhorn. I really just didn't really know any of the like the internal inside baseball kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, you know, these people are saying things that I like. And Radley Belko has done awesome work. Yeah, he's great. He is. And so but um, do you still like do you fall anywhere on the Mises Cato split or do you I mean, people do good work on lots of issues. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I consider myself a, you know, a, a full voluntarist, you know, anarchist. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff at, at Cato looking back that I'm just like, you know, I wouldn't agree with that anymore. Um, there's a, and I think that, that this conversation happens and you hear this a lot in, in our circles is that, yeah, there's great, uh, foreign policy guys over there. Uh, but uh, to be completely honest, I don't really go onto their website. I don't listen. I used to listen to the uh, Cato daily podcast. I don't do that anymore. Um, I just, uh, Knowing, you know, being so, so severely red pilled and putting it kind of in the way that, um, you know, Dave Smith puts it, which is that these people are 
blood-soaked monsters. I mean, yeah. they're. I mean, when you really think about the stuff that they support and that they're willing to 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 go and and talk about and be okay with, I I just I can't bring myself to that. So so definitely, I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm not a member of the Mises Caucus. I I, I love kind of hanging out in their uh, Facebook group. Um, I uh, but that's that's really kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, yeah. I I think everyone knows I'm a Mises guy, you know, just for the most part. But of course, the the Cato foreign policy guys, and you know, it's like I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's like uh, Radley Balco, for instance, really good on the police state, but yeah. he's still kind of a vaccine regime guy. It's from what I've seen. Yeah, I haven't. I actually haven't read his stuff lately, to be honest. Um, it was once once he closed down his his uh, his blog, I, I kind of lost lost track of him. Yeah, but it, you know, then again, he opened so many people's eyes to the police state, and me included. I, I've cited him heavily in some of my work. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like I said, it, 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 that he more, I think, more than any other individual, changed my worldview more more than than anything it was that that was a huge change for me yeah yeah i think i think for me too because i'm thinking back you know i was always my household was always kind of like you know we support the police here and law and order type kind of thing so yeah definitely and so kind of going off of your um objective morality sure. uh you know i'm sure that you you've you've dove into natural law kind of stuff and I, I wanted to see if if you listen to Mark Passio at all. Does that name ring a bell? Um, I have not. Okay, I've just been on a big Mark Passio kick. But okay. so, well, he he talks about. I mean, he calls it natural law, and basically, what he's describing is objective morality. I mean, I've heard I've heard the term. I've heard um, I've heard it referred to. I've heard natural law being referred to in things like, you know, if you jump off a cliff natural law is you're gonna you're gonna fall okay um or or also if you're gonna push someone or you're gonna threaten someone natural law is you're gonna expect them to retaliate um that's kind of how i've heard it so i haven't but i haven't really dug into the if there's any kind of specific like official meaning to it in in the way that say we would talk about common law there's a pretty clear understanding what common law is, for example. Yeah. How, in how, how do you, do you feel that common law interplays with this objective morality? Because I, I was looking at your Venn diagrams in your book and, you know, you have on the one hand, um, I hope I don't butcher this, but on the one hand you have morality and then on the other hand you have legality and there's a small overlap between the two. Yeah, um, I think with that I was trying to get to um, uh, the you know legislative legality, um, the the kind of legality that that we talk about when we're talking about the legal code, right? The you know civil code or criminal code. Um, there's tons of criminal codes on the books that have nothing to do with moral behavior, um, either trying to you know trying to punish it or or, or anything, uh, and so. You know, when when talking about what what is illegal versus you know, immoral, it, I, I found that there's just very little overlap. Yeah, and I've I've talked about this a bit on my show. This difference between natural or well, common law and positive law, and this this whole the the interlap between morality and legality has honestly been a question that's puzzled me for years and one that I've never taken the time to really drill down on. And it, it seems to me that even in a common law system, you still don't get objective law because my understanding of the common law system is that it is built off of precedent, but in the same way, those decisions usually are what is the best given the dispute we have before us. Right. That's my understanding too. It's 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 the rules that develop as people live physically near each other, and the um, and the um, uh, the culture that that's that's kind of underpinning everything. Because what what's going to be common law, you know, in a city is not going to be the same as common law in you know Appalachia. It's, I mean, you you might have some common law rules about banging on someone's roof or on or you know, making noise in an apartment, but that's just not going to apply in a lot of other places. So I think that that's kind of my 
thought behind it. I, I'm definitely, I am not a lawyer. So, uh, so I, that's, this is just kind of how I've interpreted it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, at the same time being not a lawyer, but you, you've obviously thought about this a whole lot and, and at least that means something to me, you know, uh, but yeah, I'm just thinking of, wouldn't it be nice if we had a sample size of like a body of law? And I, I think we do from antiquity, like people have talked about medieval, was it Ireland? Yeah, medieval Ireland. And you, you get some of it in Iceland um, and other parts, uh, you know, the English common law system itself from I'm sure like Anglo-Saxon times have have dealt with these things. But if we had a real like system of voluntarist judges or a judicial system that held the non-aggression principle as being the law, it'd be interesting to see if their judgments would end up being what was most practical for the parties involved. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting thought. I, I, I've fought, like, I've fought so many people, so many, you know, new, newer and caps who talk about how the non-aggression principle is so important. And, um, I'm I'm so mixed on 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 the conversation because I hear people saying non-aggression principle is paramount or the, or should be a law and those who say oh it's meaningless and I just I kind of see neither of those yeah <laughs> um, well um, so I mean, because a principle, what, I mean, the, the, I guess my, my thought is a principle is something that a person holds for themselves. They choose to follow it. And so I cannot violate your non-aggression principle. It doesn't make sense. I, I, I am either violating my own principles or I'm holding to my principles. And so, uh, but I, I mean, I understand what you mean in terms of yeah, f- having judges that are voluntarists, uh, that see that as the kind of base from which to to make their judgments mm-hmm. um so i don't that's so i i i agree that it it's it is not worthless it has significant value but it is also i don't think it should be a a law mm-hmm. if that makes sense yeah i, I think it does and th- there has been kind of Maybe, well, you probably don't identify with this, but there has been a push recently to kind of discard the NAP. And I think there's been pushes, I guess, for that for a long time. It's just this is the most recent push. Um, but but it is interesting because I've second thought it a few times myself. And it, is it more than just the term principle that you object to? No, it's, I don't even, I don't object. Actually, I mean, I don't object to anything of it. I th- I, th- okay. I think we need to be aware of what it is we're objecting to. I don't think any why well, none of the 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 um none of the anarchists the principled anarchists that I that I spend time online with would reject the non-aggression principle as a as the right way to interact with other people. I think what's been happening is the idea of for lack of a better word, codifying it or, or, or holding it as some rule is the problem. And that seems to me what people are really pushing back on, which is fine with me because like, again, I, in my opinion, and the way I see it is a principle is completely self, uh, self-defined. I see. Okay. Um, and I, I hope, I don't want to be dumb or not understanding you, but so let let me. So if if we had a bunch of courts that were using, for lack of a better term, the non-aggression principle, trying to solve conflicts in the world with property rights in mind, um, I guess would. Do you think that would produce good results? I had a question in mind, but that's not what I was trying to get at. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I I I, I think. I, 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 I think I have to say, I think it would, it would produce good results. Um, it would be kind of strange for me to say, yeah, I believe in, I believe in non-aggression. I believe in, in, in all, you know, only, I mean, the thesis of the book is only mutually consenting acts are moral. So, um, Mm -hmm. there, therefore any act that is not mutually consenting is immoral. So if, 
it, it would be kind of odd for me to say, oh, yeah, for judges to make decisions that are allow truly immoral or, you know, um, violent or, or aggressive acts from one person to another uh, would make better outcomes than one who protects uh, people's consent. Yeah, and I'm sorry, that was, I, I totally flubbed that question. I, what I'm trying to get at was, um, is that a lot of people, their criticism of the non-aggression principle is that it tends to see the world in black and white. Sorry, that's what I was trying to get I, at. Okay. And, and, and so I guess my counter to that is always, well, of course, you know, of course we can't just take the non-aggression principle and use it for every to solve every single conflict. There's going to be shades of gray, and that's why we have the court system is to solve those shades of gray. And there can be a whole common law system of decisions precedent based off of, you know, judges interpretation of what it is. This is it, it, this is purely my opinion. And, and, and I am actually what I'm going to say something, but I'm very willing to hear a counterfactual. I haven't found it yet. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm willing to hear it. But so far, I have yet to find a situation where there really is a shade of gray. And by that, I mean, in terms of the underlying fundamental um, concept of consent and of consenting and whether the person consented, whether this was mutually consent consenting versus say the facts, the case, the facts at hand did, you know, was this particular expression actually count as consent, which mm -hmm. is kind of like the next layer up or, you know, okay, you promised to, to, you know, according to the contract, you promised to deliver this money, but you didn't. I mean, the fact those for me, that's where the judgments that are going to really differ. Um, when it, my, my, um, understanding or my belief in, and what's kind of the basis of the book is that the base, the, uh, the root that can, that only mutually con, uh, consentful actions are, are moral really is black and white. There's no situation that's that where that conflicts. One person has either consented or one person has not, or they both have or they both haven't. Um, and I, I actually kind of go through a lot of, of um, situations where, um, where there could be a question. Um, I think if you can find that route, that's where you can discover the best course of action in deciding a conflict. Mm -hmm. And well, well, the one thing that comes to mind to me just right offhand is like in, in a, in a consensual sex situation is like rape or is it not rape? And if I'm understanding you right, the 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 question at hand is was there consent or was there not consent um as a part of that do you mean to get into an interpretation of the facts so like what what a jury's job would be to say okay you know they were drinking she said yes but then she struggled physically and he went anyways uh is that what you're talking about or are you talking about whether the question is you know well yeah, yeah, Sorry, whether whether the question is was there consent or not, right, right, and I and I do touch on this in the book is that the question of whether there was consent or not is a completely separate and distinct question from yeah. how was consent given, was consent expressed. Be the reason why those are so completely different is because how consent is expressed is so vastly varied in depends on the situation, depends on the culture, depends on, and the example I give in the book is if you're going to say consent to purchase a piece of property, real property, you have to get things notarized. You have to, you have to jump through all sorts of hoops and sign tons of documents. That's very clear consent um, grant granted to either buy or sell um, real property. You could be at a at an auction house and about to buy a one million dollar painting and just kind of go like that, and that means consent. That means you consented to buy that million dollar piece of artwork. 
really different situations and really different methods of granting consent. So that's why I, there, it's one of my Venn diagrams where they're literally physically separate because the question of whether that person gave consent is different from whether he expressed it properly. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. That does. Yeah. Well, one thing, uh, one thing that you do discuss in your book as well is this question of informed consent. And I think this is incredibly important right now for obvious reasons, uh, especially in the medical context. And you, you touched on a really important issue that I've come across myself in, um, in my law practice. And that is what is the types of information? And in, in, I guess this kind of goes into like um, what we were just discussing with the facts versus the issue of consent. But one of the types of information or excuse me, one of the questions is what information would someone want to know in order to consent to a medical procedure? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And I'll be totally honest, this the idea of informed consent is probably the thing I struggled with the most because emotionally, quite frankly, I, I really felt like informed consent was required. You, you, and I certainly the more permanent an act is, the more information is required in order to make that choice. Uh, so, you know, a tattoo, you know, like I said, buying property, you know, um, having children or, or having a medical procedure, for example, these are very important, permanent decisions that a person cannot reverse. Actually, I would say, I would even argue that getting a vaccine is more permanent than buying a piece of real property. And if you think about how much, um, information, how much, um, Especially if you take it into the legal side, um, how much uh, um, uh, the the um, there's a whole list of things that the seller has to uh, has to provide. All of the uh, the word is escaping me now, um, and I'm sure you know what it is. A when they have condition report, I'm sorry, a condition report. Well, it's a condition report, but you have to you have to say, okay, is there uh, an airport planned near the area? Is has there been you know any kind of uh, have your neighbors ever fought? Uh, you know, has there been you know what's the wiring like? It's all these, all of these, um, and I'm gonna think of the word when we're done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's uh, um, but it, you have you have to give a lot of information when you're, um, that's legally required, certainly in the state of California, where I had a real estate license for a while. Um, the, um, but the amount of information that you need to get a, sh a vaccine nowadays, let's just be frank what we're talking about is vastly less. Um, and it seems to be even a much more, um, life altering, potentially life altering decision. Right. That seems that seems kind of out of whack to to me. Well, I'm just I'm thinking of, you know, the types of information that like, say, when you have kids and you go into the pediatrician's office, they're just like, OK, well, today we have pertussis and we have this vaccine and this vaccine. Here's a sheet of paper where the CDC says that these are really good for your child. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Just for instance, or. Ex yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly that's exactly correct. Um, and um, so, okay, okay so getting, the, I was struggling with this because I really do feel that informed consent is required. The problem was I was encountering a lot of pushback, and it was really reasonable. The, the, the arguments against it is no one. How, how do you compel speech? If you are requiring somebody to inform you about a decision you're making, you're now compelling speech. Do you now have to, let's say if you go into a store and you buy something off the shelf, do you have to inform the shop owner of the, of the, um, uh, of the inflation rate that the, that the money you're going to give them is going to be lower in value in the next three months? No, but I mean, why not? Uh, where does where is the line drawn? But more importantly, it really came down to me to be a, a compelled speech problem. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't that didn't even appear to me. Huh. Well, I, yeah. I guess it's kind of a competing rights issue. It's it's it certainly seems that way. Ultimately, you can't you can't compel speech and a person can make a decision informed or uninformed. I think the the the, the crux is the point at which it becomes a, a problem is when you say something that is false. If you if you that's when it becomes fraud. If you just sit if if I have a car and I just have it sitting there and I have a for sale sign and I'm selling it for ten thousand dollars and I just keep my mouth shut, how much is this car? Ten thousand dollars. And you give me ten thousand dollars, I walk away. The fact that you didn't lift the hood and look under it and see that there's no engine is not really my fault. That's mm -hmm. kind of on you. I'm not compelled. I shouldn't be compelled to tell you that there's no engine, but I can't say, oh yeah, there is an engine. So we're real. I know we're really, really splitting hairs here, but I think we have to be, we do have to be careful if we want to always be sure that we are, that we are supporting um, consensual, truly consensual actions, mutually consensual actions, um, and uh, in both directions, right? Because you can't, you can't compel speech. I don't, I think that's, that's a, it, it's a challenge. Now, we can, we can get into it a little bit more, but I, I think what we, I think the conversation tends to go from moral to ethical at a certain point. And maybe that's where a lot of people see this. Yeah, I, I see that too. Uh, so for your car example, and I know this is splitting hairs, but I think it's important is that at least there is a body of law where they've developed intrinsic warranties, like warranties for fitness for a specific purpose. I remember this in my, uh, my contracts class. Um, and, and I know that's getting particular, but the, on the other hand though, I think that for informed consent, it's like, um, it's a volunteer all around. It's a voluntary transaction. It's like, okay, well you're the doctor. I am paying you for medical services. You're doing this voluntarily. What I'm merely doing is I am adding, um, I'm adding a condition upon, like if we have a contract, you have a contract with conditions that, it, you know, no one, no one is really forcing you to give this vaccine to me. You could say, "Hey, I'm going to refuse to treat this patient," um, at, at least on that end. But um, yeah, warranties for fitness for a particular purpose. I kind of remember that, but it, it's at least um, you know, there's this concept of puffery. Is that salesmen make this statement like, "Oh, this is the best grill you're ever going to have, and it's going to," you know. So, so there's uh, like particularities there, I suppose, or. Yeah, when someone sells you a car, maybe you. That is a. It's an interesting example, though. Yeah, it, it, yeah. When you when you think about and, and the example that I talk about in the book is about it's about a car. Is that is if uh, uh, say a, a woman goes to buy a a, tr a a car, how much informed consent? How much information is that are they required to give? They don't know. Maybe she takes a, a really steep canyon to work every day, and sh and she needs to know how the brakes are going to be after so many, you know, so long. And I'm sure, kind of in the the, the common law, in, in in the when it comes to um, judging uh, controversies, there might be kind of a reasonableness factor to it. Um, I really try to stay very tight with the definition of of cons of consent. Really try to stay tight with um, where does the consent line fall? Because yeah, you uh, and I kept coming back to the fact that you just you can't um, you can't since you can't compel speech. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if it comes to, when it comes to pure consensual mutually consensual activities, um, it really, it is buyer beware. It, it, that's kind of where I fell on that. Yeah. 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 I do. I do think that makes sense. Um, and I guess it, it does matter to me, it does matter how specific it is with the 
purchaser, when, when the purchaser says, Hey, I need a car and I want to guarantee that the brakes are going to last, you know, for your example, for, you know, but then again, that's not really quantifiable <laughs> or, well, yeah. I mean, you could say, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can put anything you want in a contract. Let I me, mean, that's, that's the, that both parties agree to, obviously. Um, the, uh, I, th- I think the big, the big plus, the big help is what I did in the book. And I, I, I knew a lot of people are going to disagree with this and I knew a lot of people were going to have issues with it, but I really did separate the concepts of morality and ethics mm. because these kinds of things, you know, om, uh, lying through omission or, um, or selling something, you know, that's not fit for the purpose or, um, those kinds of things or not, or not giving enough information, uh, on the medical side, I mean, sure, the doctor might give you a shot and say, okay, here's a piece of paper, the CDC it says it's great, but what if he sat there and listed every single medication and the potential, the percentage chances that every single medication could interfere with this thing? After a while, you're just like, I don't, yes, okay, I'm more than informed, I don't need all that, so where is that line? And the line comes down to the ethical uh, the ethical guidelines that are created by the in particular industry or group that the person is working in. Uh, so whether it's selling cars or, or, or their doctors or, uh, or what have you, the ethics um, are created by that community. That's a, and that's a great uh, problem to identify because when I have litigated informed consent cases or worked on them, as a team, but that that's something that's heavily discussed in the case law is, okay, well, what, where do we, or how do we create this? Um, what are the, the duty, they call it the duty. It's a part of negligence law, but where do we create that duty? And the legislature often just kind of chooses what it is right. uh, based off of lobbyists in our current system. But I, you know, and I do tend to agree with the industry setting it, but in terms of informed consent, like one of the biggest problems we had in litigating medical malpractice cases was that the legislature has determined that the duty of care for what a physician should tell their patient to obtain informed consent should be set by what a normal, reasonable physician would tell their patient before procedure. And that is vastly different than what a patient would like to hear before they do a procedure, which sure. was the original common law um, duty, as I understand it. Interesting. Interesting. Um, there's a, speaking of medical malpractice, I mean, I don't want to go into, I don't want to go into detail. Um, uh, there's just an interesting situation kind of on a, on a personal side where I, I witnessed a, a pretty big breach of, uh, of, um, of be of behavior, I should say. Um, and what's what's interesting is that the behavior had nothing to do necessarily directly with giving care or 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 informed informed uh, care. Um, but it was extraordinarily unethical. Um, and it was, you know, it kind of got me thinking about about that that, you know, that split that where, where does the, where does the, you know, ethics begin or where, where does it end and where does the morality begin and end, which is, you know, partly why I, uh, I made that split. It was just, it was a lot easier <laughs> to be honest, to, to just take each thing separately. Um, the example that I give if, uh, is that like, uh, a, a, um, a behavioral therapist, if, if you're seeing a therapist, it would be incredibly unethical for a therapist to say sleep with uh her patient um however a prostitute um has you know is not it's not unethical at all for a prostitute to sleep with her client i mean it's that so it's it's a the, the ethics really are from, from what i was seeing as i was going through it defined by the community when whether it's a a, a um professional community or a social community. Um, then I think I misunderstand uh, because, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think the ethics, you know, because at least the, um, you know, in, in the legal field, it's the state bar that that is the arbiter of ethics and they're the ones who said it. Um, yeah. So 
And it's interesting because I guess it would take a lot of time for me to try and separate ethics from informed consent, even though, because they are very intertwined from my understanding. Um, but I yeah, more into it. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess for me, it, for me, informed consent lies entirely within ethics because, because you cannot compel speech. It would be immoral to compel speech under threat of violence or under threat of losing your livelihood. It would be, it's an immoral, it's, it's to, to compel, to compel speech. Mm -hmm. However, if you're going to work in an industry and whether it be in real estate or, or, uh, the medical profession, there are, there's a higher level of ethics that you're being held to than just the very kind of base mutually consensual morality that we've been talking about. It, uh, um, and like I said, I, I know a lot of people are going to disagree and it's totally okay. I am, uh, I did this kind of separation, this clear separation to really just make it a little, frankly, a little easier for me to make sure that I understood what I was talking about, uh, when I was talking about you know, different types of activities that might be frowned upon. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I think my position, I guess would be, um, that the doctor, that it's not compelled speech, that the doctor has a choice of whether or not they do the procedure. Um, but I, I certainly understand why you would separate ethics because it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I've been trying to write a book myself for a long time and it's just, it's hard, but that's not the only reason why you did that. I, I mean, you know, yeah, it made sense. Yeah. Um, to me, <laughs> no, I think it, it does make sense. Um, it, it's, it's hard though. I mean, it's just like, and, and, and so maybe that leads naturally into my next question is like, okay, so writing a book and, and being a dad and doing this on the side, I assume. Yeah. What was that experience like? Well, I'll be honest. Uh, it wasn't entirely on the side. I had a little, uh, a little spat of, uh, of unemployment, a little gap <laughs> of employment that I got yeah. to really kind of focus on. That was kind of, it was, you know, double-edged sword there as a, a little, uh, silver lining. Um, but yes, the, I had, um, read, or I had heard about this, the story, um, about, um, and now I'm trying to think of, of the story. It, it's, it's a fictional story, but, um, talking about how, um, how do you accomplish large goals? we all have these big things that we want to accomplish. And, and sometimes those big things are just, you know, having a family or, uh, or climbing a mountain or you know, whatever your big goal is. Mine was writing this book was what was important was, is the, the story goes like this. You take all of the biggest goals in your life that you want to accomplish, that you want the, and write them all out, all your goals, and you put them in order of importance so number so from one to twenty five the, the 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 story that you put your twenty five top top goals, put them all down. you separate them into two lists the the top five you put in a list and you write the title of that is do these. So anytime you spend doing something, it's applying towards one of those goals that you have. And on the other twenty, the ones that you really still want to do and love is you write, Avoid at all costs. And what that did for me was that said, you have to let go of something. You have to let go of some things that you love and that you want to do in order so that you can accomplish something that you love and want to do. There was no other way I could do it. Um, and so I let go of a lot of things. I, I love making board games. I love making video games. I love making music. I love chatting on Facebook. I, you know, so the only things that le that were left on that do do list is the book and family and making an income. And that was it. And that's, it got me focused because I'm, I have absolutely no focus. <laughs> normally yeah no i i can um 
I certainly relate to that. <laughs> it's hard to stay on task for sure. Um, so it, it sounds like did did you kind of break the task up into manageable chunks, like self-contained parts? What, what I started doing is every time I had a thought that I thought might go into the book, I just dumped it. I just used OneNote, like Microsoft OneNote or something. I just started d just dumping stuff just throwing it and throwing it and throwing it again. And, and it slowly kind of coalesced um, into, into what it is. Um, uh, what at, at the end of it, or the, I shouldn't say the end of it, because I don't mean the end of the book. At the end of the, as, as it was really kind of coming together, I had my thesis, right? I had my, 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 my proof that consent and morality were, were equivalent and how to get there. But then I had to build, I actually, I actually had to build backwards to say, okay, then how am I gonna get people who've never heard of this to, 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 to come in? So I had to explain, okay, what is ownership? What is self-ownership? How can I prove itself that you own yourself? And what does that do if you can't? And, and I had to go back and back and back. And then I had to go forward from that point and explain, okay, now that we understand the consent and morality are equivalent, what does that mean? How does that apply to a, um, a, you know, a complex social environment or how can that apply to billionaires? You know, you've got a billionaire walking by a homeless person. How does that apply to that? Um, and so I, built it in that direction that that was kind of my my process you're really making me think here and i'm getting distracted by it now that we're talking about it, it's like i'm still thinking about that ethics question it's like <laughs> yeah no but i i see where that leads and and i've run into that in my own you know attempts to write something it's like i i tried to make an outline you know and then where I'm hung up on right now is the fact that I want to read like 20 books about the subject and where am I going to find time to that, to do that. And then writing through, you know, you want to like highlight certain things and then put it into an outline or an index. Um, did you do any of that at all when you were writing? You know, I, I didn't. Um, and I think I, that you, you kind of have the, you know, the, the, you know, the Scott Horton syndrome, right. In the sense that that's what happened when he went to try to write his first book, he tried to write, you know, the, what, what's currently in enough already, but ended up with like one chapter being an entire book of Afghanistan. Right. That's the story that I understand it that he's told. And, and he, he describes the, the importance of footnoting every single claim. And for that kind of book, I completely, I completely see where why he would need to do that. If you're going to write a legal a book that's got a lot more hooks on actual law, then you're probably going to have to do a lot more reading and a lot more, um, a lot more footnoting than I did. Mine, I really just stuck to base philosophy. So, uh, to be quite honest, I had talked about these topics so often, a lot of these chapters just flowed out as if I was writing a long. Facebook page, uh, a post. Um, and so there was a lot of, of more technical stuff that I needed help with. I, I didn't know how to punctuate a, a sentence to save my life, but thank goodness I had people who jumped in and helped me and on that side. But in terms of the content, you know, I just kind of put, put it out there as I saw it. Um, and it's possible I could come back later and go, Oh, what was I doing <laughs> when I wrote this? Um, but, um, for the most part, no, I just kind of, I just kind of, just kind of came out of, of me and my, and my thoughts and my, and my understanding. Yeah. Well, I think it's a huge accomplishment. I mean, I'm just, whenever, whenever someone comes out with a book, um, I'm just always like, yeah, that, that should be me doing that. <laughs> Well, it's it's small too. I mean, it's it's not. I mean, I think uh, what did it end up being like thirty thousand words or something. So it's kind of it's pretty small. It's really it's really it, well. You're holding it that way. Is it going to hold it this way? So it's it's yeah. it's. You, I mean, a fast reader could probably knock it out in a, in a day, I guess. Um, but um, believe what's interesting is believe it or not, what I'm more, even more proud of is the typesetting. I, I I'm that I'm the most proud of, of this yeah. book, not even so much the content, but the typesetting, because I, I balanced every single page in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in design, the whole thing, yeah. every font, every space is completely thought of and, and, and controlled. Uh, so that took probably almost as long as actually writing it. Yeah. 
No, I, it looks good. And and like, so what about the self, uh, the self publishing stuff? Because I, one thing I've noticed and one thing I've thought about in my own work is how how high quality is it going to be? And the pages don't feel cheap. They feel. Yeah, yeah. I, I went I went through Lulu Publishing, so I'm I'm very happy to to admit that and talk about that. Lulu Publishing, uh, it's so fantastic. We live in the best time in the world. It is so awesome if you want to do this, and it doesn't have to be this kind of a book with, where it's just text and a few a few diagrams. They have really high quality paper, glossy paper, um, edge to edge printing, and what the even the best part about it that i'm still geeking out over you can hear it in my voice is i created a shopify store um so it's just an online store and then there's a plugin a lulu plugin you drop in your your pdf um uh typeset file you drop in your cover your 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 layout you know your kind of open cover uh file and you set the price and you click publish and you and anybody who buys off of my website just kicks off a request to Lulu who prints it out on the fly and sends it directly to the customer. I don't have to do any of that stuff. It's so amazing. I love it. I wake up in the morning, I see an email, someone bought your book. Awesome. That's it. <laughs> That's all I have to do now. I mean, unless they order an autograph copy or something that I have to sign and send it off to them like that. But um, it's uh, it's it is we we live in a in a wonderful time to be to be a publisher, uh, either you know um, magazines or, or 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 print or you know even that there's an ebook copy on the on the uh, on the website, you just download it instantly. It's just it's so great, it's so easy. Well, I don't want to be done yet, but what's the website? To send oh. people to copy. Well, um, the website is the name of the book, consentismorality.com. Um, and um, I should probably, I mean, since, I mean, if if it's cool, I can kind of talk a little bit about uh, about the um, housekeeping on the on the book side. We don't have to be done, but um, definitely, the, yeah. The 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 cool thing that I I mean I I can't. Uh, take complete credit for this idea. Um, I used to listen to uh, Freedom Fiends, and uh, so uh, Michael W. Dean was the was the guy behind the mic uh, for Freedom Fiends, and he talked about a way of of bringing Bitcoin into your to across a border by taking words in a book and making them your uh, passphrase to a, an encryption key. And that is actually what I did in a, in a, in a kind of a marketing, I guess you could say a marketing gimmick, but in a marketing way, um, I actually put some Bitcoin into a wallet and I have been handing out clues to how to find the pattern of words that are in this book that will unlock the Bitcoin wallet. Um, and so far I've given away five out of 10 clues. I'm going to give uh, real quick. I'm just going to go ahead and give the sixth clue right now, if that's cool. Cool. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So, okay. So every clue has three words. Today's clue, the sixth clue is include the preface. Include the preface. That doesn't mean anything to you right now, but if you go on to consentismorality.com and you um, just uh, and and you click, there's a link that that gets you to the rules, and you'll see where you can go to all the other podcasts I've been on where I've given all the other clues. So include the preface as clue number six. Um, go find the other five clues and be the first one right now. The Bitcoin, the wallet's got like 0 0.01, so not a lot, but still, I think it's over 500 bucks right now. So. That's not too shabby. Very cool. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome marketing tool. <laughs> I think so. I think it's fun. Um, I was hoping to get it in front of Tom Woods to, you know, get his, because he's always looking for, you know, new marketing ideas and stuff. But uh, it's, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> really hard to get uh, yeah. get his ear. Well, I mean, the for you, the longer it goes on, the more people look for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I it, it, that's true. I have a uh, a promise that it, for every book that I sell on that website, on the consensusmorality.com website, I'm going to put an extra dollar uh, USD um, into the um, into the wallet. Um, 
And so if I sell 10,000 books, I'll put 10,000 books in. I don't have a problem doing that. Um, the uh, since, since going through that website is a direct support uh, for me as an author, because there's literally there's all I'm paying for is printing it and so and shipping it. And so um, it's a uh, it's a great opportunity for authors, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, that lights a fire under my ass, but uh, <laughs> we'll um, let's let's close here just by talking about your article. When does imposing risk become aggression? And I think we. Uh, we've kind of danced around this a little bit so far, but um, you have been writing articles for Liberty Weekly, which I am incredibly stoked about. And thank you so much for your articles. They are awesome. I appreciate that. No, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of my way of contributing. Uh, I'm I'm really, really, really happy to be uh, contributing and adding to the to value. Yeah, for sure. And well, um, and, and I think it, it's useful. I mean, it's great value here, too, because this is a problem that I think that we have to confront because I had Ace Arkist on. Uh, we mentioned your article in, in my podcast with him. But I, I think the the most the thing I hear most often and I should have had you on first to talk about this. Um, but the thing I hear most often from people uh, is that, well, you have rights, yes, but you don't have the right to pass the virus on to someone else. So I think this kind of like confronts that argument head on. But can I just hand the torch over to you to kind of talk through your argument? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's no problem at all. Um, but kind of like the, um, you know, the, the ethics question we talked about, this one, uh, this one was also really challenging for me because I do understand and, you know, you, you fall back to the um, – uh, well, actually, before I start going into it, why don't I take a step back and and and, and explain, yeah, the, the question is the, – the, you know, the question of the, of, the, of the article is when does, when does um, risk become aggression? And I think it's very easy to see the two extremes. If someone, you know, takes a revolver with one bullet and it spins it and click, click, you know, that's obviously a risk that – someone is putting you under which can be pretty much any reasonable person is going to consider an aggression um versus i think the example i give in, in the article is you know the, the airline changes their route and now you have a plane flying over you at forty thousand feet when there wasn't one yesterday that's an extraordinarily tiny risk um so and somewhere in between there's a line at which you can you are morally allowed to physically stop the the risk being imposed on you and where is really where is it and i i think unfortunately i it, the 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 cold quick answer is there there is no clear line it's going to be different with different societies it's going to be different with different people different situations um i think the big when that we figured out and i heard you talking about it on your show is the fact that risk is just really a percentage chance of something happening versus an aggression which is an action taken that you can stop and hopefully i'm wording this this, this correctly um and it's I'm trying to think if there's a better way of getting through it. I mean, I, I know you all talked about the, the the drunk driving thing and you know, you can always talk about, you know, if if you know the old the old standby, okay, can you have sex with people if you have AIDS without telling them? And even that can go towards the, you know, cons, you know, uh informed consent conversation we talked about. Um Oh, I remember now. I remember the the, the thing that was really the, the big plus was the fact that um, in with the drunk driving example, there was external evidence that you can use to determine whether the person is a is a risk to the point of making aggression. If if I'm walking around with a gun, a loaded gun in my shirt, in my jacket, no one can see me then there's no evidence that I'm a risk. So therefore there's no, there's no more authority to stop me from carrying that gun. If I'm walking around, waving it around, 
that's an external piece of evidence, you could say, wait a minute, <laughs> there's additional risk happening here. And you could so you could make an argument at least that you'd have that you could have the moral authority to 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 halt that. Yeah, and it's it's hard too because um whether or not someone has COVID-19 is obfuscated by the fact that literally the um the symptoms of COVID-19 can be so many other illnesses. And I I think it, it's hard too because um none of those other illnesses are fatal. And in fact, COVID-19 itself is, I, you know, what, you have a 0.01% chance of dying from COVID across all age groups. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly that, that gets higher the older the individual is or the, the more infirm someone is. So it, it just becomes difficult because I guess that even means that even though I have a right to stop someone, if, if someone is clearly suffering from the bubonic plague, I probably have a right to... Um, you know, we're in the store together or on the street or something, a right to physically make them distant from me. Um, but with COVID-19, that becomes harder because someone could have tuberculosis or they could have the common cold. And, and so that just makes it more difficult. It makes it extremely difficult. I mean, and um, tuberculosis, I think, I mean, it kills over a million people a year worldwide is my understanding. Um yeah, I think it was, it's it's really interesting. Is I, I as is I think that's I, uh, that's the longest article I I put out on on the website. But I, I really had a challenge with it when it came to because I do understand the stance of you don't have a right to breathe on me if you're sick. You don't have the right because that it's what's the difference between say if I'm coughing on you versus I've got a syringe with tainted fluid that I'm spraying on your something. I mean, it's, it's essentially the same thing. Um, but I think when it comes to using force, when it comes to using physical force, you're, you have to be able to demonstrate, you have to be able to prove it. I mean, you can even fall back on, on basic legal theory. I think if you, if you're going to use, force to quarantine someone or to, to take a vaccine, you have to demonstrate evidence. <laughs> of, yeah, I'm yeah. looking here, we were just kind of talking about this, but um, the Wisconsin DHS code has attempted to uh, codify exactly, you know, what proof has to be offered before you can quarantine someone. And uh, you need to prove by clear and convincing evidence Let's see. Um, petition is supported by clear and convincing evidence that they were that due process was given, that the remedy proposed is the least restrictive on the respondent, uh, which would serve to correct the situation. And I'm I'm trying to just see. I think it's has been linked. Uh, let's see. So DHS 145.06 Wisconsin DHS Administrative Code. Persons whose suspected condition poses a threat to others. A person may be suspected of harboring a contagious medical condition which poses a threat to others if that person exhibits any of the factors noted um, uh, in sub 2, which is something else, but and in addition demonstrates any of the following without medical evidence which refutes it. So if they've been linked epidemiologically to exposure to a known cause of communicable d disease, so that's so pretty loose. I mean, it seems like you could say so and so said that she was with typhoid Mary for 15 minutes, you know. Right, or they could say, "Hey, in order to in, in order to enforce this or enact it, we need to have a tracking device on you at all times to make to see if you're, you know, you are in contact with somebody else that way we can um although it doesn't say that, you know, directly, but I could certainly see a politician say, "Oh, well. oh, right, yeah." Well, oh, we, well, we just need, you know, COVID trace, like uh, what is that contact tracing app? Right. Them. But when this started happening in my town, basically, when the health department started quarantining children in high school who had alleged, allegedly had 15 minutes of close contact with a COVID positive individual, first off, no one in our town knows 
that you can refuse. And if you refuse, they have to get a warrant and you have a court hearing, the right to a hearing. That's my understanding. That's not legal advice to anyone in my hometown listening. Um, they just need to read the DHS code. But when I was reviewing it, it, it just it was so alarming to me how much power that this gives the DHS code. And I mean, I'm somewhat of a conspiracy theorist and the infrastructure for this has been in place for a long time as if they were waiting for the chance to like roll this out. Like I can see when these statutes were added and it looks like this was added in 2000 and 2008. Wow. That recently, it seems like. Well, I mean, to be honest, that's, it almost kind of you know proves your point, which is some things like okay, we've been thinking about this for quite some time, so let's just get it ready. And I, you know, you hear that that's the case all the time that you know a, a problem happens, and hey, here's the solution legislation. Right. How did you write a thousand pages of resolu- of uh, legislation in one day? You you didn't. You had it ready to go. Yeah, yeah, like problem problem reaction solution kind of thing. I know that's kind of a buzz phrase. <laughs> I saw you posting about 9-11 a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. I'm always... I, 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 I tend to be more of a skeptic to me. Sorry. Oh, um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, there are things about 9-11 that I will absolutely entertain. I mean, I made a meme um, of it's that it's, it's a picture of the cloud kind of coming and people running from it and George Bush holding one of those cartoon, you know, dynamite plungers running away from it, you know, <laughs> yeah. smiling. Okay. So I, you know, I'm totally cool with, with, uh, with, with hearing rational explanations, <laughs> uh, to, to things. Um, there are certain things that I, I'm just not going to entertain now. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally put you on the spot about that. I'm sorry, but, oh. um, yeah, well, um, yeah, so I did, I found your article back to the COVID issue. I found it very useful. And, and if, if only for framing the conversation and of course, Walter block had a piece on it that ACE Arcist and I discussed. And so, um, I, I don't know about you, but it took me an awful long time to really start looking into COVID like, like not just that, but like the libertarian arguments surrounding it yeah um i think that the one thing that really struck me at first was the when i i was at at first i was talking generically libertarian but i i am going to reserve it to the blue pill so-called blue pill libertarian um they're a private company they can do what they want kind of thing if you don't like wearing a mask in store go to another store those kind of folks so i did make a meme uh where um it was the one with the guy kneeling with the gun in his head and and it's it's the government is saying enforce my mandate essentially and then the guy saying please please wear a mask or leave and that this was the blue pill libertarians idea of property rights so very early on i did i did see the problem uh, with with uh, small, you know, individual businesses being forced to enact the mandate, uh, which actually we could probably have a I mean, multiple other uh, shows, or at least you could probably do multiple other shows on on the privatization of tyranny, essentially privatization of the of the um, enforcement state. But that said, um, I didn't really get into the um, into the medical stuff myself. Um, my father, unfortunately, uh, ended up with leukemia and passed away in the middle of this whole thing. And so I'm standing here wondering, and he was, he was kind of guy that had CNN on in the background and stuff. And so I just wonder, uh, and he didn't leave that and he didn't leave the house. Would I have been able to catch that, that, um, the leukemia if he hadn't been fear mongered into not leaving the house for a year, oh. I'll never know. I'll never know. So that really kind of kicked me into high gear in terms of really seeing what the hell is going on here. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that about your dad. Um, yeah. In I should give myself a little more credit because I was skeptical pretty early on, but I guess I didn't really explore, you know, the medical stuff behind it and then trying to, you know, think through all these, you know, arguments because everyone in the media and 
all the blue pilled people online are just they're they're throwing these allegations and it's like these people whoever um whoever is kind of in the media setting the narrative um or at least the narrative they try and put in the corporate media is so intelligent and they're so good at what they're doing because they create these buzzwords and phrases that are so catchy in these terms and the use of language and all someone like Stephen King has to do is throw out this buzz phrase that he he, he heard and then it's on us to write what 1500 <laughs> word essays to refute that exactly yeah yeah it's 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 the bane of of the person who wants to use logic versus emotion yeah for their for their arguments it's um we, we, I mean, in a way, in a way, I'm you know happy that that kind of you know the the meme culture has kind of has has evolved because it is a way for us to to tap into that emotional side with the logical argument in a little you know nippet. So it's it's you know we have our op- we have our our tools, um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's it's they, they can they can they can tap into a simplistic argument um, that. Uh, it takes, it would take, you know, volumes to really unpack. <laughs> and yeah. And I've never been good at the meme stuff. I don't know. I, I do what I feel like I can do. And then it's like, um, well, you, you sound like you're a practitioner of, of memeology or memetic warfare. You know, Pete, Pete is so good at it. Pete Quinones is so good at it. And I just, I've tried my hand a couple times and I'm just not good at it. Yeah, he's he's the master uh, for sure. Uh he's he's retwe- he's tweeted a couple of my memes from time to time and it oh, yeah. gets gets me all fanboyish, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um uh the uh it 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 definitely is its own art form. It's definitely its own communication method. Um I I'm I'm pretty happy with a lot of the the, the memes that I've made um but uh and I get, I definitely get banned <laughs> my, my share, my fair share. Yeah. Well, I haven't been banned yet, which kind of makes me feel like I'm not really doing what I should be doing, but yeah, well, uh, Sean, it's been great. I think we should, we should, uh, wrap it up there, but is there any place other than, um, your website that we should send folks? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, consensusmorality.com. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and throw it real quick. I, I added a uh, discount code for any viewer or listener. If you use Liberty at the checkout, you'll get thirty percent off of an autographed copy, which is pretty decent chunk there. Um, so Liberty at uh, consensusmorality.com get thirty percent off. Uh, I'm at Facebook. Um, I look like um, an arco capitalist of the opera. That's what my picture kind of looks like. Um, and I'm I'm gonna embark on a attempt to I'm planning this is right now in the planning stages to read my book instead of in an audio book but just read it in its entirety on TikTok. I think there's some opportunity to reach some folks there uh, who love consent, the idea of consent. You know, kind of the woke folks, maybe the younger woke folk who understand consent is important, um, and try to snare them in a little bit. Uh, to get some exposure to this, to these ideas. So that's kind of my next thing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I, I didn't even get to talk about the messaging of consent. Seems like it's more geared toward the left. That's kind of what I wanted to do. Yeah, I did kind of want to tug on those strings a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, well, that's wise. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, you know, and I'm sure it won't be the last time. Oh, any time at all. This has been absolutely a blast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for coming on. We'll talk soon. All right.